Father, how lovely your dwelling place is, Lord. Father, I thank you for what you did here last night, Lord, that it carried on to the very first service, Lord. And I pray that we would respond and then this service, Lord, to your sweet love, Father, that we would surrender to you, Father, for what you're doing, Father, for what you're accomplishing in this church, Lord, what you desire to move, Father, the way that you desire to move us, Lord. I ask, Father, that you would continue Father, to move as you desire, Lord. Let your spirit overwhelm us, Lord, that we would respond in surrenderance and obedience to you and you alone, Lord. We thank you for all that you're doing, Lord. Be glorified and lift your name up high, Lord. Let us worship you in your presence, Lord, because you are here among us, Father, and we praise and worship you, Jesus. It is in your precious name that we pray and ask, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Please. 
brazen altar, Lord, I want to see your face. Pass me by the crowds of people, the priest to sing your praise. I hunger and thirst for your righteousness, but it's only found in one place. Take me into the holy of holy. Take me in by the blood. Touch my lips, here I am. Take me past the outer courts to the holy place, past the brazen altar. Lord, I want to see your face. Pass me by the crowds of people. The priest to sing your praise. I hunger and thirst for your righteousness, but it's only found in one place. Take me into the holy of holy. Take me in by the blood. song we could ever see worthy of all the praise we could ever bring worthy of every breath we could ever bring we live for you Jesus the name above every other Jesus, the only one that could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever be, we live for you, oh, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside. 
true in our lives, Lord. Lord, we commit to live for you this morning, Lord. We pray you would fill us with your breath, Lord, that you would fill us with your life, that you would fill us with your spirit, that we would live for you tomorrow, Lord, that we would live for you this year, God that you would move in us and that you would move through us, Lord, that you would accomplish your plans and your purposes and that we would be surrendered in peace 
Lord, to what you're doing in us, Lord. We thank you for it. In your name, Jesus, amen. Amen. Have a seat. <clears throat> Hi. Happy New Year. Hey, thank you very much. I kind of forgot it was New Year, uh, first service, but, uh, but I remember now. Uh, hey, you, thanks for standing against the back wall. You guys uh, kind of remind me in, in, of myself in grade school. Hey, go stand against the back wall, kid. Uh, just kidding. You probably have never experienced that, any of you. Maybe Emma. Uh, no, she hasn't. Uh, it's great to see you today. Uh, if you're here uh, for the first time this year, uh, welcome. Great to have you. <laughs> did, you have, did you have a good New Year? You did? You guys got in the front row, huh? Yeah. What are you going to do? <laughs> you either love the front row or you hate it. It's like Volkswagens. Uh, I, I love it. I hope you guys love it. Uh, so we have a couple things I forgot to tell everybody first service, so I'm trying to commit to not uh, this service. First of all, in the back is a quilt for Janet Longevin. Uh, Janet's been a near and dear friend and family member here forever, uh, as far as I know. Uh, at least, uh, I don't know, 13, 14 years, I'd say, right? Maybe 15 years. Anyway, it's been a long, long time, and she is in a really, really difficult uh, physical um, and uh, kind of mental, physical becoming mental condition. She's in a rough, rough spot. She really needs your prayer. So there's a long story about her on the back. At the prayer quilt, if you're not familiar with the prayer quilt, it's the Covered in Prayer uh, Quilting Ministry. And uh, you go back there and finish the quilt by praying and tying a knot uh, in the quilt. So be sure and do that. And, uh, and the ladies will deliver that to Janet uh, ASAP, probably today. Uh, next is a men's breakfast this Saturday. Uh, my son David is going to be speaking, and uh, if you know me, if you think I, I speak directly, uh, I am genuinely, um, you know, like Mr. Rogers compared to my son. Um, he brings the heat, and uh, a couple of, uh, of tours uh, with the Marines and the SEALs will do that to you. And he will bring the heat on Saturday here. Uh, he's going to be not here, but at Marcello's. Not here. Marcello's. Breakfast pizza at Marcello's, all right? Take everything you like for breakfast, put it on a pizza crust, and cook it. Uh, it's a custom deal that John does for us down there. So uh, be there at 8 o'clock Saturday. And David will be teaching on uh, no brother left behind. That, that. Oh, last night. Wow. Were any of you young enough to be here last night? Okay, all right, you guys, how, how was it? It was out of control, right? It was out of control, all right. Bree and Stephanie were here, the rest of you, and 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 uh, No, you're too old, sorry. Uh, last night was our first Saturday night, young adult service. Hey, Anthony, we were here. Dude, you didn't raise your hand. Come on, bro. Uh, humble. No, it was out of control. Oh, you're cold. It was, it was out of control here last night, uh, 18 to 35-year-olds, and the room was pretty full. Uh, it was really, really a great group, uh, just really great worship. Uh, Grant Shaw brought a great gospel message, and uh, they, we had to, we got to get him a key because ultimately we had to kick him out of here at about 10.30 or something. Um, but you're welcome here uh, if you fit the age range. <laughs> Uh, so we're really trying to limit it uh, because, because they do it all. You know, it's like no old people telling them what to do. Just Jesus. Um, and a few of us standing in the back. Uh, but uh, these, these, uh, this ministry team, uh, Proclaim ministry team, is uh, really lighting this place up. Started last night. You don't want to miss it. Tell somebody, be here this Saturday uh, for that. And I think that's it. Right? Did I miss Lisa's not here? Manny, was that everything I missed first service? All right, we're going to let you give. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your miraculous provision. We thank you for your provision in each of our lives personally, Lord. And we thank you for your miraculous provision for this ministry. Lord, we are left in awe. Lord, with a a burden of responsibility 
because you've done so much in such a small place. And you've impacted so many lives and Lord, your word has gone out so far and Lord, you are raising a banner for the glory of your own name in this place, a light in the darkness that's shining brighter and brighter. And Lord, you call us to be part of that. And as we give, we are, Lord. And Lord, you've done so much and you have so much more to do. We thank you for this incredible property, Lord, for your provision to be here, to continue to be here. We pray, Lord, for the planned growth here this year. We just pray you would continue to accomplish your plans and your purposes, Lord, that we would continue to follow hard after you and be amazed by what you're doing. And as we give, Lord, we give with that attitude, that approach. We're amazed. We're in awe. We're blessed beyond measure. And as we give, Lord, we know it's out of the blessings you've given us. We thank you so much for allowing us to be part of the supernatural kingdom work you're doing in this place and beyond. And we give to that end for your glory, Jesus, alone. And in your name, amen.
Give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to bow our hearts we bend our knees oh spirit come make us humble Lord again we pray make us humble Lord, you're at work in our lives. We pray you be at work for the deeper things, Lord. That you would continue to transform us, Lord. That we wouldn't see our circumstances or our situation as something to avoid or, or get over, but that we would see you at work in it, in them. We pray that you would continue to transform us, Lord, to mold and shape us to leave us in awe of your work in our lives and in your work around us. We pray you continue the work you're doing in each of us, Lord, even now, even in this place at this moment. Please continue to be glorified and move upon our hearts and minds. In your name, Jesus, amen. Amen, praise the Lord. All right, youth, see you later. Hey, by the way, like, um, you know, uh, seniors in high school, you guys can sneak in to, uh, to the young adult study. <laughs> there. Uh, yeah. but, not, but not if you're 36. No, no, you can if you look 35. Uh, it, <laughs> what? You can, <laughs> no, you look 36, sorry. <laughs> Oh, man, it's good. All right, praise the Lord. Open your Bibles. This is a great New Year's message, and, and I didn't know that it was. I, I kind of forgotten it was New Year's. <laughs> like, whoa, we're just racing ahead. But this is the first Sunday of the new year, and uh, God has a message that's like incredibly perfect uh, for you today. Uh, so hear the Holy Spirit say that. Title of the message this morning, Be Content, Part One. What I'm thinking of is a 52-week message called Be Content. So when we get to Be Content, Part 50, Part 51, uh, we're, gonna be, we're gonna be getting a hold of it today. We're going back to Ecclesiastes chapter six, excited to still be in Ecclesiastes. You know, the more we study the book of Ecclesiastes, which I've loved personally studying, uh, the clearer the lesson becomes. The true lesson of the book of Ecclesiastes is this. Be content now. Right now, today, be content. Solomon has been pointing at it since the very beginning. Today in chapter six, we get in the thick of it. We're right in the middle of the book, and, and this is considered the hardest, most, the hardest hitting chapter in the book. It is right in the middle, and Solomon is shaking us and trying to get through to us the vital importance of us being content in this life right now. So let's pray, and we'll see what God has to say to us to inspire us to be content today. Lord Jesus, would you? We live in a discontented culture. We need you, Lord, to break through to reveal to us, Lord, what you have offered to us, Lord. Next to salvation, one of the greatest secrets of living this life under the sun. Lord, you have a way for us to be content, to learn how to be content. We pray today, Lord, that you would inspire us to seek after it, to learn and to be transformed into a content people. 
We thank you in advance for what you're about to do, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. Is it just me, or has this book been incredible so far? <laughs> right? This is an incredible, hi guys. This is an incredible book. Uh, I, I love this book. I happen to be at the absolute perfect place in my life personally and in this ministry to really receive what Solomon is saying in this book. I mean, if you're there with me, uh, you understand. This book has been speaking volumes to me. I pray it's not just me. I pray you're not here just for me. Uh, anyone else, the book of Ecclesiastes has been speaking to all right, this is powerful stuff. This is really, really radical stuff. Today we begin, not really begin, because we've been pointing at it, but we begin to focus on the real central message of Ecclesiastes, and that is being content in this life. It's just part one. Uh, we decided, uh, we, me and the Holy Spirit, uh, decided this morning, uh, after a late night, long day late night uh, with the uh, young adult service last night, uh, we decided to make this a two-part message. So, uh, so I'm just gonna do mostly background today and really lay the foundation to finish the chapter uh, next week. But trust me, there'll be plenty of scripture. Let's begin by defining contentment. Uh, the definition that I chose to use is really short. It's only two words, so it's not on the wall behind me. Listen very carefully. Here's my favorite definition of contentment. Here it is. Peaceful satisfaction. Doesn't it just make you like, right? Right, Brenda and I learned how to say law. Law. No, say law in the Psalms, it means to breathe. And this is what this word, this definition of contentment does for me. It makes me just exhale. Peaceful satisfaction. It's being satisfied and at peace. It is, it is being peacefully satisfied. Oh, that's good, right? Do you know a Christian, a Christ follower who could use some peaceful satisfaction in their life? Come on, be honest. Thank you, Bree. One writer uh, for Focus on the Family tried to describe contentment like this. It's a little longer than two words, so I'll put it on the wall, but I love this effort to try to describe, not so much define, but paint a picture of contentment. Here's what Focus on the Family writer said. He says, money can't buy contentment. There's a news flash. Money can't buy contentment, and poverty does not provide contentment. Contentment is knowing God has a plan for your life, having a strong conviction to live in that plan, and having a firm belief that God's peace is greater than your trials. Who needs some of that? Come on, this is what we need, all right? All in, sold out Christ followers. We need to know that contentment is knowing that God has a plan for my life, that it's at work, and me having a strong conviction to live in that plan, within, inside that plan, and having the firm belief that God's peace is greater than my circumstances, greater than my trials. Here's the problem, Christian or non-Christian, our culture thrives on discontentment. It thrives. It actually runs on us being discontented. Here's how you know. All advertising, and, and, and really I wrote most, but it's all. All advertising is based on this principle. First, you make someone discontent. You make them discontented in your ad. It only takes 30 seconds to do this because we're trained so well culturally. We get discontent really fast. You make them discontent with what they have and where they're at in life, and then you promise them, you convince them, and you use a pretty woman if you, if you have one available, especially if you're selling cheeseburgers. Uh, that's the connection. You convince them that they will be content if they buy whatever you're selling right? You convince them that they're discontented now and that all they have to do to become content is buy what you're selling. Our entire culture runs on that false logic. We buy what they're selling to us all day long. We either buy it physically, tangibly, like if we can, we actually buy it, or we at least buy it in our hearts. 
What I mean by that is we say, yeah, that's right. As soon as I get that cheeseburger, I'll be content. Uh, Whatever, as soon as I get that blank, I'll be content. We buy what they're selling to us in our hearts, and here's the truth. What the world is selling and what too many of us are buying will never make us content, not for one minute. And even intellectually, we may agree with that. Oh, yeah, I've been a Christian a long time. I know that. Really? Do you? (laughs) Talk to God. Be honest, all right? Because Hebrews says, all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. God knows. And we, we kind of like know intellectually that, that what the world's selling won't make us content, but, but too often we buy it anyway, either physically or, or at least emotionally, because we're, we're in this, like, this, this life of being discontent and trying to be made content. And so even if we do buy something to make us content, there's something else right behind it to make us discontent again. So we buy that again, either physically or at least emotionally. Here's the thing that I think adds in our particular season in this culture, adds tremendously to our discontentedness. Here it is, social media. Oh, man, is social media dangerous, okay? I, 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 I just, you know, if you haven't figured it out yet, here it is. Here's the news flash. Every time you see that perfect Instagram mom and you say, oh, that's what my life really should be like, all right? When the camera's not flashing, news flash, her life's not like that, okay? We call that living through Instagram in our family. We're just living through Instagram. Every time, if you happen to be me, every time you see the perfect Instagram pastor, right, or the perfect Instagram church, you say, Lord, if, if, if I was just like that, you know, if our church was just like that, then, then everything would be okay. See, I have the sickness just like you, just because I'm standing here doesn't mean that I don't struggle with the same thing. Listen, social media is, is, is gotta be, I mean, the whole, don't get me started, okay? <laughs> just know that's a really dangerous thing you're holding in your hand. That's why it has a cracked screen because it's a cracked piece of technology. And so here's what happens with, with, with this discontentment, especially when we see it in social media or when we see it in a cracked screen. We develop the twin fires. I, I, I imagine like a rocket taking off in the old days. Uh, they used to take off from the ground. And the the twin fires would light up. And the twin fires that I see are discontentment and then the big one, envy. And you mix discontentment with envy and you have guaranteed life destruction about to lift off the lunch pad. And our world functions at a base level. Our culture functions at a base level. And so we're driven, we're driven to acquire more in what they say, we're, uh, we're driven to look like they say we should look, we're driven to, to become what they say we should become. And then finally, when we're done and it's all over, we're left burned out literally on the ash heap of life. And we're looking back and saying, what have I done? What was I chasing? Why did I do all of that? To a very large extent, that's exactly where Solomon is. And it's a good thing for you and I that he is. Solomon had chased more, acquired more, became more, achieved more, experienced more than all of us in this room times a thousand times a thousand. We, we can't grasp how much this man chased and won, how much he acquired and attained and how much influence and power and wealth. And and in Ecclesiastes, he's looking back on the ash heap of his life and, and, and saying, what was it for? What's it all mean? Why in the world did I do all of that? And so if the wealthiest, wisest man who ever lived has gone through this and is left on the ash heap of his life looking back in regret, then we have the opportunity to learn from his life of mistakes 
and not repeat them ourselves. This is the good news. This is why Ecclesiastes is in the Bible, and this is why so many of us are afraid to deal with Ecclesiastes. Like, yeah, I don't, I don't get that book, you know? Uh, listen, Solomon is looking back over his life and saying, man, I gotta, I gotta tell you something. I've been there, I've done that. I have a mountain of gold you could ski down. I've got a thousand wives and concubines. Let me tell you something about life. And when he does, we should say, we are listening. God, you gave this man the most wealth and the most wisdom. You had him write this down. We have this chance to learn now before we get to where he's going. We have a chance to ask the wisest man in, on earth, the wisest man who's ever lived, what am I going to wish I would have known when I get to the end of my life. Can I know now what I'm gonna wish I would have known at the end of my life looking back? What do I need to know now to help me avoid the devastating discouragement of reaching the end of my life with your level of regret, Solomon? Because if you've read through Ecclesiastes, you're like, okay, this guy's like suicidal about his life. Um, and, and he's achieved everything I'm striving for, times a million. He's acquired everything all of us could acquire times a million. Why is this guy so regretful and so discouraged? If we can learn from him, then we are in a good place. So Solomon starts today in chapter six of Ecclesiastes by saying, what's the use of gaining all the wealth and all the honor and everything we want, what's the use of gaining it all if we end up not being able to enjoy the true blessing of contentment, of peaceful satisfaction? And if you just look a little bit into between the lines, Solomon's talking in the third person, but it doesn't take too much to see that he's his own test case, that he's speaking of his own life. You ready? Ecclesiastes 6, verse 1, hold on. Solomon says, there is another serious tragedy that I have seen under the sun, and it weighs heavily on humanity. Verse 2, God gives some people great wealth and honor and everything they could ever want, but then he doesn't give them the chance to enjoy these things. They die. And someone else, even a stranger, ends up enjoying their wealth. Here's the hammer. This is meaningless. A sickening tragedy. I love the NLT's translation. This is a sickening tragedy for someone to receive, even from God, great wealth and honor and everything they could want, but then not have a chance to enjoy those things. He's kind of implying that's God's fault, but it's because of this state of mind he's in. He's very much like Job, where he's saying, come on, God, how come this didn't work out for me? Well, what did you do this to me for? And I'm not so sure God's accepting uh, his argument there. I say God's not, personally. Uh, the words they, meaning, meaning, listen, pal, I gave you everything, all right? You messed it up yourself. And next week, we'll, we'll remind ourselves from 1 Kings how he messed it up, but that's for next week. Then he says they die. They're kind of in the middle of verse two. They die. These words aren't in the original, uh, the original manuscripts. They're added by the NLT to connect these verses to the following context. And so it's not just this picture of this guy who gets everything and then gets hit by a bus. You heard about the, the guy who won the lottery, right? Who, and this is a true story. I'm not kidding. A guy, guy won the lottery. I forget how much it was. You know, whatever, 100 million you know, whatever, triple, jackpot, zero, whatever it is, craziness. <laughs> you know, no one's ever happy after they win the lottery, right? You know, they're all sorry they won it. There used to be a TV show. You know this. Google it. It's crazy. But one of the stories I've read is the guy that, that went down and picked up his check, and then he was so he was so like in love with his money, he stepped off the curb, literally was hit by a bus and killed before he even deposited. This isn't funny. Why are you laughing? <laughs> That's not just what Solomon's talking about. Solomon, Solomon is saying, look, the people that God gives this stuff to, 
if they don't find peaceful satisfaction, if they don't find contentment, then it is meaningless, the end of verse two, and a sickening tragedy. All the wealth, all the honor, everything we could ever want without contentment, without peaceful satisfaction, sickening tragedy. If you were Solomon and you had all the great wealth and the honor and everything that he had, and you realize at the end of your life, at your old age, looking back that all that you've acquired and all that you've done and all that you've accomplished, that, that you've never actually found contentment in that. Because, because aren't we always thinking, well, contentment's coming. Contentment's coming. I just gotta buy what they're telling me to buy. I just gotta be what they're telling me to be. I gotta look like what they're telling me to look like. And, and so you go through your whole life, and, and even if you accomplish it, there, the, there's, there's, it's not one brass ring. It's like, it's like the, the gymnastic rings, you know, that are all in a row, but they never end. And you keep grasping the next brass ring, right? And then at the end of your life, you look back and say, what have I done? You end up devastatingly discouraged. That's where Solomon's at. He's already made it clear very, very many times. We've seen it throughout the book as we surveyed the book in our, I think, second message that material blessings from God in and of themselves will never bring contentment. We just read in our last message, Ecclesiastes 5.19, it's on the wall. This is our last Ecclesiastes message. Solomon says, and it is a good thing to receive wealth from God. That's great, praise the Lord. And the good health to enjoy it, praise the Lord. But here's the catch. To enjoy your work, and accept your lot in life, this is indeed a gift from God. This is a reference to being content, to enjoy what you do, to be doing what God made you to do, and to be enjoying it. And this accept your lot is, is to us, we, um, we interpret it or define it a little bit different. It means to be content with what you're doing. It means to be happy, to get up in the morning and say, Praise the Lord, I get to do what God made me to do. I, I get to do what God's given me to do. This is my place. This is where God's created me to be. This is the plan he's laid out for me. And I get to go do it today. I am peacefully satisfied. I am content with who God is in my life and what he's given me and what he's given me to do. You see it? Oh, that's really good. So some of you would say, yeah, try me. I'll take that lottery gamble, okay? Give me a shot. I'll be content with all that money. That's all I need is money. The only problem in my life is money. Listen, the only people who say that are people who have no money. The only people who think that the lottery is actually a win, you know, that winning the lottery would actually be good, are, are people that, that have never experienced wealth. Anybody that I've ever known that's experienced true wealth would disagree 100% that wealth brings any sort of contentment, any sort of peaceful satisfaction. In fact, it's quite the contrary. I've had a chance to get to talk to, not, you know, through my family, and it's kind of a long story, but anyway, um, an heir to a big, uh, I, I won't say the name, but anyway, a big, you know, whatever, long 100 year, uh, 200 year, whatever, food company. And uh, um, he's a wreck. And so they asked me, hey, Dave, will you call him and just minister to him? Yeah, I'll call him. You know, which house in which country? Where's his Learjet? You know, just give me his number. And, uh, um, he can't sleep at night. He, he doesn't know who his friends are. You know, like he has one friend. It's a, a family member. I mean, he's probably got others, but, but he, um, he lives on the edge all the time. And he's got more money than all of us combined times 10 will ever be able to spend if we spent as much as we could spend every day for 100 years. And he can't even lay down at night and sleep. He has no contentment. So I tell him about Jesus, and I don't ask him for money because that's what everybody does to people who have money. 
if you find somebody who's truly wealthy and ask them, if I spend my life fighting and scratching and kicking and, and climbing the ladder and grabbing the brass ring and I get the money you have, will it make me content? They'll be like, oh, you foolish child. No, it will not. So why do we think it will? I'll tell you why, because the culture's convinced us it will. The culture is lying. It is lying. Contentment is about being peacefully satisfied, being peacefully satisfied with what God is doing in your life right now and who God is in your life right now and where he has you in your life right now. You saying, okay, God, it's you and me. It's okay. I'm getting up. I'm doing what you called me to do. I'm at peace, even in difficult circumstances. I can promise you this. This is, this is, this is what Solomon is trying to get across to, to us young, foolish Christ followers. He's saying, look, if you can't learn to be content now, you will never be content wherever God has for you in the future. If you can't be content right now where you're at, then whatever God has planned for you in the future, you won't be content there either because no outside circumstance or situation is gonna make you content. Contentment is an inside job. That's what Solomon is trying to get across to us. That peaceful satisfaction with life comes from the inside. Are we learning that? This is a really big question. Are we learning to be content Think about it. When was the last time, and I don't mean to make this a New Year's resolution. Last week's message was make a life's resolution. All right, New Year's resolution. Hello, that's so they could sell you something next January. Another New Year's resolution. Buy this machine this year. This one will really do it. You don't even have to get on it. Just hang your clothes on it. It'll cause you to lose weight. Uh, no. Um, are we, do, when was the last time we said, I'm gonna set myself to learning to be content? I'm gonna put all my energy, all my focus in my walk with the Lord on learning to be peacefully satisfied where God has me today. We, we generally don't do that. Why? Because we're too busy chasing contentment because we're too busy chasing the things our culture says will bring us contentment, but we're never actually learning how to be content. This is, this is Solomon's desire. He wants us to learn to be content at whatever level of wealth God gives us, little or much, either way, it doesn't matter to your contentment. Whatever level of health even that God gives us, little or much, either way, it doesn't determine your contentment. But if we're pushing to gain more and achieve more and accomplish more and become more, thinking that that is contentment, then we are running down a bad, dark, slippery road. And we don't find out till the end when we look back and go, whoa, that didn't work. That's what Solomon did. All right, Dave, you've made your point. Too bad, I gotta make it some more. It's the only, only point I have. Even if you make it where you think contentment lives, it doesn't live there, it's a mirage. As soon as you achieve what you think's gonna make you content, an ad's gonna come on TV and convince you you're not content, you need something else. You need the next brass ring. We have to learn it where we are. The wisest, wealthiest man who ever lived says nothing you gain materially in this life will ever make you content, whether little or much. We have to learn to be peacefully satisfied today right where we're at. It doesn't mean that you don't change sin or, or, you know, or conflict or dysfunction in your life or in your family. That's not what, that's not what um, the Bible would, would ever you know, encourage. But it means in the battle, we're at peace. Yeah, I got some stuff. I got some sin that, that God is crushing out of my life. I got some flesh that I'm crucifying. I got relationships that are in conflict that I'm restoring. I have a relationship with God that's not what, what I would like it to be. All right, that's not being discontented. That's being content knowing what to work for, knowing the plan that God has for your life and the purpose and pushing ahead to accomplish it. Does that make sense? All right, that's a little caveat. 
It also doesn't mean that you just sit around, you know, play the video games, hang out with your friends at the dispensary. Uh, This is not contentment. This is not contentment. God made you to do something. And I don't know what it is. It's something different for everyone. But God made you to do something. And as you embrace that and become part of God's purpose and God's kingdom and do what he's called you to do, you find contentment in your life. You find peaceful satisfaction. That's what Solomon's trying to say. Again, it's an inside thing, not an outside thing. Listen, contentment is a spiritual and relational thing. Contentment is being in the right place with God spiritually. Think of the Lord's great, the greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God with everything you've got. So it's being in a right relationship with God. And then what? Being in a right relationship with others. Love your neighbor as yourself. This is like the, the place where contentment comes. Is it easier to do if you have a lot of money, middle money, or no money? It doesn't matter. I mean, it's just not about it. It's not about that. It's, that's our marketing world telling us that somehow it's connected to material things. It's connected to relational and spiritual things. And when we're right spiritually and right relationally, we're at peace with where we're at. And we accept that God's at work, that we're in his plan, that he does have a plan. We're grateful for what he's doing for us today, and we're trusting him for what he's got for us tomorrow. Everything is okay, Right? It doesn't mean there's no trials. Jesus promised there'd be tribulation. It doesn't mean there's no conflict. It means that you're not, you're not just discontented and trying to grasp at something that's just gonna make you more discontented. Commitment, I'm sorry, contentment means being in a right place with God and with others. Contentment comes from having the peace of God that passes all understanding. All, if, if, you are, if you're a Christ follower in this room, you can quote that. Oh, yes, the peace of God that passes all understanding. Yeah, when was the last time you lived in it? Well, you know, I read about it in the daily bread. Yeah, okay, that's all right, all right. When was the last time you said, you know what, Lord? I'm gonna learn to walk in the peace that passes understanding. What does it look like? What does it take? Contentment comes, listen, listen, please. Contentment comes from loving and serving others in your life. The single most discontented people are people who are consumed in self-focus. It's all about me. These people are in deep, deep trouble. But the people who are giving and giving and and caring and loving and serving others in the name of Christ, these people are content. They have a peaceful satisfaction about their lives, right? Because it's really not about you and not about you acquiring what you desire to acquire. (laughs) I like that, desire to acquire. That's tweetable. Listen, contentment comes from having a gratitude to God and a trust in his plan for your life. God, I'm thankful for you today. I trust you completely for tomorrow. This is a peaceful, satisfied place to be. I thank you for today and I trust you for tomorrow. Everything that brings true contentment in our lives is polar opposite of what the world is selling us. We tell people all the time, listen, if you wanna learn how to walk in the spirit, here's the first rule. Whatever you wanna do is wrong. (laughs) Whatever you think you should do, it's wrong. It's the flesh. So, So step one, you feel like you wanna do something? Okay, crucify it. Now turn to God, right? This is the same thing with contentment. Listen, listen, that, I'm sorry to use, you, you guys know what I'm talking about when I use the cheeseburger, right? I mean, ha, look, at advertising reached a new level of absolute insepid stupidity, you know, when the porn model is selling a cheeseburger. I mean, come on, this is like a perfect picture of how ridiculous Our culture has gotten selling us stuff. Nothing they're selling 
implying there's contentment, none of it will bring contentment. So rule number one, see something on TV, that won't bring me contentment. See something on your cracked screen on your phone, that won't bring me contentment. So now I know that, so then you can turn to God and say, okay, God, what will bring me contentment? And you can begin to learn how to be content. Moving on, don't you think it's about time? Moving on to verse three. (laughs) I told you we were doing background, right? That laid the foundation for the whole chapter. So now we're going to rush through four verses. Ecclesiastes 6, 6, verse 3. Solomon says, a man, listen, it gets more radical now. That wasn't, the first two verses weren't the hard part. This is the hammer right here. It begins the hammer. Verse 3 of Ecclesiastes 6. A man might have a hundred children and live to be very old, but if he finds no satisfaction in life, again, it's a a reference to contentment. If he has no peaceful satisfaction, if he finds no satisfaction in life and doesn't even get a decent burial, it would have been better for him to have been born dead. Kablam! What are you talking about, Solomon? He's talking about a very big hammer to try to get our attention. Listen, in that day, like today, having children was a blessing. And so, so this is a, a hypothetical person as far as we know. Solomon could have had 100 children. That, was on, that would only be one child for every 10 wives or concubines. And he could have had 100 children. He didn't, uh, but he could have. And, and so I kind of feel like he's pointing back at himself. But, but 100 children would be the greatest blessing. So we could paraphrase that by saying the greatest blessings of God. That's what children are. He might have 100 children and live to be very old. But if he finds no contentment, no satisfaction in his life, and then look at this line, and doesn't even get a decent burial. Can you imagine 100 children? And when you die, they're like, just put him in the dumpster. That's what he's saying. Would have been better for him to be born dead. Wow. The absolute worst possible insult of that day, and I think maybe today also, is to not have a decent burial, especially when you have children. But I think that Solomon might have been worried a little bit about a story I heard one preacher tell that was true. That's not a, not a setup for a fake illustration, a true story. Young preacher goes to his first funeral, doesn't look like a preacher. He's wearing his dad's suit, you know. <laughs> All young preachers starting, like, really? Take the suit off, okay? But anyway, uh, not everywhere, but it, so, so this young guy, this preacher goes to this funeral. He's young. He sees a group of guys standing over there, and the family says, oh, those are uh, his coworkers. He was their boss, the person who had passed away. And so he walked over to this group of men, and he says, thank you for being here to honor your boss. And immediately one of them spit on the ground and said, honor him. We're here to make sure he's dead. Right? So it didn't work out great for him, as far as a decent burial goes. Yeah, I think he's dead. You check him. Make sure. Right? This is what Solomon is saying. It gets even worse because this imaginary man with 100 children, um, it, he, it, it's not just that his coworkers, let's say, hated him, but his 100 children did. Why? Well, the implication is because he's chasing wealth and honor and everything that he can gain. And in the end, he doesn't take any of that with him, and he leaves behind a hardcore exhortation, illustration that you and I can live by, but it's not enough. So Solomon goes back to the tool shed and gets a bigger hammer and brings a bigger hammer out and hits us with it again in verse four. Look at what he says. He says, his birth, now speaking of this man, who had all of this and 100 children, his birth would have been meaningless. He's like saying, you know, it would have been better because his birth would have been meaningless. And he would have ended in darkness. 
and he wouldn't even have had a name, verse 5, and he would never have seen the sun or known of its existence. Here's the killer. This is the double-sized hammer. Yet, he would have had more peace than in growing up to be an unhappy man. Are you telling me a man that had the greatest blessings of God illustrated by a hundred children in, in hyperbole. Not only would it have been better off if he was born dead, but he would have had more peace than what he had when he died. That's hardcore. Solomon is bringing it home. He's like, listen, I'm trying to get this across to you. You ever done that to your kids? I mean, you know. I, I, you know, maybe you have to, your kids, <laughs> right? Like, come on, just listen to me, please. I've done what you're doing. I've been down this road. Solomon is this times a million. And he's saying, listen, you get all those blessings with no contentment, you would have more peace if you were born dead. Try that on one of your kids. Yikes. All right, that's the knockout punch right there. More peace than dying, a discontented and unhappy man. And by the way, at the end of verse four, where it says he wouldn't even have had a name, your name at that time, even more today than today, was a reference to your character, to who you were, to your history, to your destiny, to your dynasty, your family name. It meant everything. And Solomon says, it would have been better if this man didn't have a name. Right? It's like, a scourge on the family. Wow. <laughs> Solomon's saying, listen, this is what I'm trying to get you to understand. Don't chase what I chased. Don't become what I've become. Don't have the regrets that I have looking back over my life. And then he says, wait, wait, just wait here a minute. He goes and gets another hammer, bigger than ever. This is like, um, what is it? Like the Looney Tunes cartoons, right? And they just keep going and getting a bigger hammer and hitting like Daffy Duck or whoever it is. And now the hammer is like as big as a house, right? Here it is in verse six right here. Ecclesiastes 6, verse six. He, meaning this person, might live a thousand years twice over. That's 2,000 years, but still not Find contentment. Even if you chase the brass ring, chase the, that fake prize of contentment through something outside of yourself, even if you chase it for 2,000 years, you would still not find contentment. And since you must ultimately die like everyone else, well, what's the use, Solomon says. This is the key to the whole book. Whatever you're chasing, thinking there's contentment there, you can chase it for 2,000 years. It doesn't matter. You either learn to be content now or you never will be content chasing whatever you're chasing, thinking it will make you content. It's like that person, this is not true, like the person that asked God if he could live forever and stay on earth. And God's like, yeah, you want to, go ahead. And so he gives him what he asked for, and that night on the way home, he's in a car accident, and people are killed, and he's convicted of multiple murders and put into prison for life. And so he lives forever in prison. You live for 2,000 years chasing some false hope of contentment, you will end up like Solomon after 2,000 years saying, what's the use? We either find it now or we don't find it. Either we learn to be content today or we never will be content. All through the Bible, God makes it clear. Contentment does not come from outside circumstances, situations, material things, anything that's not 
inside of our heart. Anything that's not spiritual and relational never brings contentment, yet we chase it all the time. Solomon's expressing this, that living for God and enjoying life is the secret to contentment. And and you've seen it. I've already read you the last verse of the book. It says, fear God and enjoy life, you know? Fear God and do what he made you to do. Just live for God and do what you're made to do and you'll find contentment. The apostle Paul knew the same thing. He spells it out in Philippians 4, 11 and 12. Paul says, for I have learned. Doesn't that give you some hope? Or personally, that gives me some hope. I'm like, hey, God, the apostle Paul had to learn how to be content. So, you know, can you give me a little more time? <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, because he's the apostle Paul after all. And he had to learn. And so if you and I have to learn how to be content, then we're right there with the Apostle Paul. Paul says, I have learned, in Philippians 4.11, I have learned how to be content with whatever I have, because contentment doesn't come from what you do or don't have. I've learned how to be content with whatever I have. Verse 12 says, I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. Again, saying is outside circumstances or or you know, material possessions or anything outside of him doesn't matter. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned, again, that's hope for me. I have learned the secret of living. See, for me, it's not the material stuff, right? For pastors, we get fed this, this lie that if God's with us, our church will look like this, you know? And in our particular movement in my early days, uh, they learned, you know, thank God that, you know, Old Calvary Chapel pastors can learn too. Eventually they stopped, but, but in the early years, they would parade all these, we called them the kings, the kings of the movement up. And they would imply, hey, if God's with you, your church is gonna look like ours, you know? Your church will look like mine. Um, it takes a lot to unlearn that as a pastor. It takes a lot. And God's done a lot to help me learn that. And I'm grateful. I'm so grateful for it. We have to learn how to be content, to be satisfied and peaceful. That's what Paul's saying. I have learned the secret, the end of verse 12, I've learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little. And this is why this famously misquoted, misused, uh, just absolutely, uh, <laughs> whatever, I could say other things, but this we'll just say this misused verse, Philippians 4.13. The reason Paul says, verse 13, which is in the Amplified Bible behind me to try to help uh, explain a little better, Paul says, because of this, because of what, Paul? Well, verse 11, he says, I've learned how to be content. Verse 12 says, I've learned the secret of living in every situation, which means I've learned to be content. And so then verse 13 says, so I have strength for all things in Christ who empowers me. Why? Because I've learned to be content. I thank God for today and I trust him for tomorrow. And so if tomorrow brings some difficulty or some conflict or some battle or some lack, it's okay because I've learned how to be content here and so I'll be content there. That's what Philippians 4.13 means. It doesn't mean you can win the croquet match, okay? (laughs) Whatever. I can do all things through Christ. (laughs) Stop it. It means means that content in Christ, I can face any circumstance, any situation with peaceful satisfaction. We've got to learn to be content. We have to learn how to do it today today or we'll never do it. Here is my last tweetable tweet. Twitter's going away, right? But it's, it's just neat to say tweetable tweet. Don't tell Twitter they're going away, but Instagram knows they are. Here's a shortcut to contentment. We're gonna talk about it more next week. Here's a shortcut. Number one, be truly thankful to God for your today. Be truly thankful to God for your today and trust him completely for your tomorrow. God, I'm truly thankful for where I'm at today, for who you've made me and what you're doing, and I trust you completely for my tomorrow. And we'll talk more next week how to move in that direction 
Until then, remember Paul's words to young Timothy, 1 Timothy 6, 6, godliness with contentment is great gain. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, that's what we want. We want contentment, Lord. We may not even know. We maybe have been striving and pushing and achieving and accomplishing for so long, Lord, that we just think it's real life. But Lord, we've been deceived and misled. We've been confused and captured. And we're being tortured by, by the false ploy of the world driven by the prince of the power of the air, that something besides you will give us contentment. Now we repent today. Lord, we're sorry. We're sorry for thinking any change in circumstance or situation is gonna give us peaceful satisfaction. Lord, reveal to us today even as we prepare for communion, reveal to us, Lord, that our contentment comes through a right relationship with you and right relationships with those around us. It comes from a genuine gratitude, thankfulness to you for today and a total, complete trust in you for tomorrow. Teach us, Lord. Teach us to be content for your glory and in your name, amen. Let's prepare for communion.
already done. The love of the Father revealed in the Son. So open your heart up to His kingdom come. Won't you receive what He's already done? It's already done. It's already done. The love of the Father revealed in the Son. As we uh, take communion, it draws us to that very last supper that the Lord had with his disciples. When he said, take and eat, for this is my body. Take and drink, for this is my blood. Last night, we had a service here last night, and it's one that I am very grateful to the Lord that I can serve under. Through his prayer, he brought me through that, to that very moment, what the Lord did for me. And as I read, I ask that you would open your heart to receive what the Lord did for you. Through the book of Isaiah, it was prophesied what the Lord would go through for us. And it goes, but many were amazed when they saw him. His face was so disfigured. He seemed hardly human. And from his appearance, one would scarcely know he was, he was a man. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weakness he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we can be healed. All of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter as a sheep is silent before the shears. He did not open his mouth. Unjustly and condemned, he was led away, but he was struck down for the rebellion of my people. He had, not, he had done no wrong and had, not, had never deceived anyone, but he was buried like a criminal. But it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. Yet, when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. When he sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. And because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous. For he will bear their sins because he was exposed, because he exposed himself to death, he was counted among the rebels. He bore the sins of many and interceded for rebels.
Lord Jesus, as we come to this moment, remembering that moment, Lord, we're shaken by your love for us. We're overwhelmed that the King of heaven, the one to whom glory and honor is due from all creation, would experience those words for a lost sinner, an enemy, for us. Under your wrath and headed to an eternal separation from you, you became us. You took on our sin. You yourself paid the full wrath required upon it. And in exchange, Lord, you gave us your righteousness. And we did nothing but spit in your face while you were doing it. Those Roman soldiers, they represented us. Those religious leaders stirring up the crowd to cry, crucify him. They represent us. And so, Lord, we remember what it cost you to save us when we were your enemies. And I would just encourage you right now, before we take communion, to receive the free gift of Jesus Christ paying for your sins in your place to make a way for you to be righteous before God for eternity. And before you receive the bread and the cup symbolizing his body and his blood, receive his free gift of salvation. You can whisper to him in your heart, Jesus, I receive you. I don't wanna go through the motion of taking communion. I want your life to become my life. I want your life to well up in me until Rivers of living water are gushing forth from my very being. I want my life to be replaced with your life. And Lord, we remember what it took for that to happen. The brutality of our sin laid upon you, and by your stripes we are healed. As we take the bread, Lord, may it symbolize your life taking over ours. Let's take the bread together. And Lord, may we receive the covenant of grace, the new covenant in your blood. Lord, your blood was shed so that ours would never have to be. You gave your life in our place so we would never have to die, Lord. The, the wrath due upon our sin was poured out on you so we would never have to taste it. It's not fair. It's almost impossible to grasp, but we receive it by faith. And Lord, we'll be eternally grateful for it. We thank you, Lord, for the shedding of your blood, for the payment of our sin. And we thank you for the new covenant, Lord. We receive the cup as we receive the covenant of your grace. Let's take the cup together. Lord Jesus, we pray that you would take over our lives, that you would fill us, Empower us, transform us, be glorified in us, Lord, and teach us to be content. We pray you go before us as we go for your glory and in your name, Jesus. Amen. 
Amen. Praise the Lord.